Good morning. Good morning, Oak Stone. Do I need to do the slide? Okay, there I am. So how many here thought I was Brian Smith? <laughs> so I get that a lot. I've, I've met uh, some of y'all from Oak Stone, and, and a lot of times the first time somebody meets me, they say, Brian, right? I'm like, no, but bald guy with a beard, yes. And uh, we both live in the same place, actually, in, in uh, East Tennessee, but I am not Brian Smith. I am William Bratrude, is how you pronounce my last name. I've had a hard time with it my whole life, so... Don't, uh, don't worry if you don't, under, you don't get that one. But uh, how's everybody doing today? Good. Awesome. Wow, I feel so high up here. Am I okay on the camera? <laughs> My head isn't cut off, right? <laughs> so um, interesting story uh, leading up to me coming out here to visit with you all at Oakstone. Um, the Lord put me through a trial about, about a little over two weeks ago. Um, I was working and I totally overstrained my back and I believe I herniated a disc and I was out of commission for the last two weeks. In fact, up until about two days ago, I had to get around with crutches um, and uh, haven't been able to work and I didn't know if I was going to be able to make it. I I believed, I I had faith that the Lord would make a way and that he would put me into the condition where I could make it here today Um, and he did. I woke up Friday morning to head to the airport and... uh, and I could get out of bed and I could walk. And, uh, and it's, it's been good. Still a little bit of pain there, but, but God is good. So I cannot see the slides, but I guess I'll try and monitor myself here. Okay. Whoops. Okay, there we are. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Didn't see that. I'm going to be speaking today on the works of Jesus. And wouldn't you know, John 14, 12, truly, truly, I say to you that whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Who in here has done greater works than Jesus? I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> Yet, this is the word of God, and this is what, this is what the Bible tells us. This is a promise. The, the Messiah that we follow said, truly, truly. It's not just true. This is truly, truly, for certainty. I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. So there's some debate in the church today as to uh, the miracles, right? Signs and wonders and whether or not as disciples we are able to perform miracles and perform things like the works of Christ and the works of the apostles. And there's debate in the church and some people are on this side of the fence and they say, no, those things were for back then and they've all been done away with. And then there's the other side that says, no, we miracles and and signs and wonders are still for today and the gifts of the spirit are still for today right so what does it say in in 1 Corinthians 14 Paul addresses this issue go to 1 Corinthians 14 He says, to desire earnestly, to to follow after love, and to desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. So Paul is telling believers in his day that we're to pursue love, and we are to desire spiritual gifts, or spirituals, is how how the Greek reads. And these are the workings of God, and the working of God, of the spirit in our life. This is like the song that we sang, spirit come, tongues of fire, prophesy like it's been done, right? But do we live as if though God wants to use us still to reach the lost and that he will confirm the message of the gospel through signs and wonders? Or do we question whether or not these things are still for us today? So this isn't going to be a, a, a teaching on whether or not you should be on this side of the fence or that. 
but it is something that I, I, I just wanted to touch on here. Now, who, who has seen any, who, who in here has ever believed they have seen a miracle? So we've got a good number of people right here in this fellowship that, that believe that they've seen a miracle. Who in here believes that they have ever taken part in, in performing a miracle? A little more sparse. A little more sparse, as, as I would expect, right? But I think if we look close enough, we go back, we look at our lives, we would actually see places and times where God probably has worked through us in a miraculous way to do something, maybe to speak into somebody's life and prophesy, but they never told you. They never told you, right? So, what were the works of Jesus? Now, keep in mind, these are things that, that he said we would do greater things. I'm going to have a really hard time with that. So, I think the first miracle we need here is for God to open everybody's eyes to be able to read my PowerPoint, <laughs> including me. So, the first miracle here, Jesus turns water into wine, okay? And this is in John 2, 1 through 11. I always wondered, what, what's the significance of this? Really? It says that this was the first miracle that he performed, and his disciples believed on him. Did you ever wonder why? Why would this be the first miracle that Christ performs? He goes to a wedding where people have been drinking all, all day, maybe for a couple days, and they run out of liquor, they run out of alcohol, they run out of wine, and he goes and he creates six more pitchers. And now these pitchers, I don't know if you understand the, the historical context of this, but they were, they were vases that stood about yay high, and they're about yay big, and they held, I don't know, it was about 50 gallons a piece, I think. They were big. They were equivalent to like the 50-gallon drums that we have today that carry liquid. Okay, and these were, these were water pitchers, and they were made of stone. And in this miracle, he tells the servants, go and get the, the six water pitchers of stone and pour water into them. And then take some of that and go and serve it to the master of the feast. So they do it. And when they take it out and they go and serve it to the master of the feast, it has become wine. Okay? This is getting a little out there, a little kooky probably for some of you. But spiritually speaking, this, this is a perfect picture of salvation. This is a picture of what Christ does in the heart of men, okay? Six being the number of man, okay? Stone, hard, empty vessels. Pouring the water of the word into these vessels and filling them to the brim. And it converts into wine. Not just any wine, but the best wine. Representing the Holy Spirit. Right? This, there, there's imagery here in this first miracle of, of salvation. Of what God actually does in the heart of men. So don't think of it as, oh, he just went and made a bunch of people who were already drunk even more drunk. Right? I struggled with this when I was a young believer because I, I used to believe that you had a sip of alcohol, you were sinning. Right? And, and maybe some in here have the same belief. Maybe not. I don't believe that anymore. That's for another day. So secondly, and these are, these are not necessarily in chronological order of, of how he uh, performed these miracles, but the second one is he heals the sick. He drives out demons. Do you believe that we still deal with the demonic today? That there are still believers and unbelievers who are demon oppressed? Absolutely. Absolutely. How about this one? He creates money out of thin air. Who remembers that miracle? You remember that one, Justin? Yeah? Let's turn there. Luke 5, I'm stretching a little bit when I, when, I, when I phrase it this way. In Luke 5, verse 1, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake. 
But the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. So he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and he taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drop. And Simon answered, said unto him, Master, we've toiled all night. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, and their nets broke. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they would come and help them. And they came, and they filled both ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished in all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. He created wealth for these fishermen out of thin air. They toiled all night. And you know that he can do the same thing for us in our lives. That we can spend all of our time and all of our energy toiling for whatever it is that we're after, and we can always come up empty. We can always come up lacking. And all it takes is obedience to the word of the Lord. You just, you just listen to what the Father has been telling you to do. Listen to what Christ is telling you to do. Read the Bible for direction in your life. And when you're obedient to the word of God, God will, will bless you in ways that you never could have imagined. And it is a stretch to say he created wealth out of thin air. These guys ended up leaving their business and leaving the pursuit of worldly things after this to follow Christ. And aren't we all called to the same thing? Aren't we all called to, to leave the things of this world and to follow Christ with all our heart, not to have one foot in and one foot out? So he cleanses a man with leprosy. He heals a paralyzed man who was lowered through a roof. And you take note in that story that it, it was the faith of the man's friends that contributed to his healing. They believed so much in the power of, of Christ that they were willing to go and tear the roof off of a house of somebody they don't even know to get their friend into his presence. That's how much they believed that he would be healed. Do we have that type of belief, right? I think in our society, in our day and age, we have gotten so far away from, from the times of Christ. And we have so many comforts in this country <laughs> that which of us would, would go to situations this desperate for healing for ourselves or, or for a loved one? So he... He heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. Uh-oh. That, that was a big deal. You don't heal on the Sabbath. Even today, I think there's a lot of things we're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. Whether it's in the Bible or not, right? Men will tell us, you can't do that on the Sabbath. Where does that come from? We should not go beyond what is written in the Word of God. If the Scriptures speak to it, we have a leg to stand on. He raises a widow's son from the dead. He calms a storm on the sea. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with this story of Jesus calming the storm on the sea, okay? But this was not just a, this wasn't a thunderstorm. It wasn't a rainstorm. This was like a category five hurricane. Those guys thought they were dead. They thought this was it. They, they were at their wits end thinking, this is it, the ship is going down and we're all going to die. And they cried out to the Lord who was sleeping, okay, under the bow of the boat. And it says that he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves and said, peace be still, and they were calm. And the disciples were afraid and said, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the waves obey his voice? Did you know that this was prophesied in the Old Testament, that this very event would happen? Put it in your notes. If you take notes, Psalm 107, verse 23 through 32. You can read a prophecy about this, this very event that Christ fulfilled. 
It's a prophecy about the calming of the storm. David was a prophet. In fact, the, the entirety of Psalm 107 is prophetic. And it takes you through the history of God's people all the way from Abraham all the way through the end times and what is still yet to happen. And it's broken up into segments and it's all very prophetic. And much of it has come to pass and much of it will come to pass. But it's, it's fascinating when you dig into the word of God, these treasures and these jewels that you will find. So a woman is healed by touching his robe. She touches the fringe of his garment. She's healed. This woman was so desperate. She, she reached out to grab the corner of Christ's garment. And she believed that if I can only touch the, the fringe of his garment, I'll be made whole. And he looked down at her and he said, he said, woman, your faith has made you whole. Interesting, while this happened, another man who had come to him for help, whose daughter was dying watches Christ stop instead of continuing to go heal his daughter he stops and, and heals this woman and then the servants come and tell the man your daughter already died don't bother him anymore and then he turns around and he says don't worry she, she isn't dead and he heals her with a word That was Luke 8, 40 through 56. I'm just going to go through these fast because I don't want to spend a lot of time here on these scriptures. Uh, he heals a man by putting mud in his eyes. How crazy is that? Right? Jesus says that he, he spits in the dirt and he made mud and he put it in this guy's eyes and then he told him, go wash in the pool of Shalom. And the man went and washed and he came back seeing Okay. How about this one? He heals a blind man by spitting in his eyes. Did you know that? Did it, who, who, knew, who knew Jesus healed a blind man by spitting in his eyes? If you saw a minister or pastor, if David came here and a blind person was in the audience, okay, and, and you had David pray over this man for healing, and, and you, you all saw Pastor David spit in this guy's eyes and then put his hands over his eyes and then take him off and say, do you see? What would you think? <laughs> you got to bottle that stuff. That's a different take on it. I would think this guy isn't only crazy, he's cruel. You know, that's what they thought about Christ. They thought that so deeply about him. They were so convicted that he, he, was, he was off his rocker, that he was a lunatic, that they killed him. They had him killed, right? And he did things that were extremely unconventional. And so I don't want you to think that the miracles of God and when God works in our life, don't put him in a box. Don't put him in a box. I think all too often we're too quick to, to look at uh, something that happens and to, and to pass judgment on it. They were, they were telling each other, we think he's doing this by demons. He's driving out demons by the prince of demons, right? So he was very judged for what he did, and he was not conventional, but I will tell you this. Whatever the father told him to do, he did it. And so I know that if he spit in that man's eyes and that man became seeing, it's because the father told him to do that. The man was healed. I found it fascinating. I, I'm, I'm, I'm one here who did not know that he spit in somebody's eyes to, to open his eyes. That was, that was a revelation to me. I thought the, the mud in the eyes and this were, were the same story, told a different way. But it's not. You've got to go back and, and in Mark 8, um, 23 is when you're going to, I'm sorry, and I, I duplicated that scripture. Y'all Y'all know how to search the scriptures. So you go look up these two stories and you verify yourself. Be, be Bereans and go verify for yourself whether or not this is true. He casts out demons and drives them into a herd of pigs. He heals a man who was mute, couldn't speak. 
He heals a man who had an infirmity for 38 years. Let's turn over there real quick. Um, that one is... Ooh, I have it wrong on my notes. Is anybody familiar with that scripture? <laughs> I'm just going to go over it with you. There's, there's this man who's, who's at, the, uh, at, the, at the pool, okay? And he would go under the, under the portico in the synagogue, and there was this pool. And all the crippled people and the sick people would come, and they would lay around the pool. And Jesus shows up one day, and it says that there was many there. There were many there who were maimed and, and sick, right? And when, when they believed that an angel would come down and stir the waters, and then when it did, the first one into the water would get healed. So it says one day that Jesus shows up, and he walks in, and he sees this man who had been crippled for 38 years. And he, and he walks up to the man, and he says, do you want to be healed? And the man says, he didn't say yes or no. He just says, every time I try to get down to the water when it's stirred, somebody always beats me there. And Christ said to him, take up your bed, rise and walk. And he took up his bed and he walked out of there healed. 38 years this man could not walk. Here's what I want you to take away from that. There was still a multitude of people in that area, sitting around those waters that were not healed that day, right? One of the other questions is, does God heal everybody instantly, all the time? For the past two weeks, I've been laid up using crutches, can't work, can't get around, can't get dressed. I couldn't do anything. Excruciating pain for two weeks. Knowing I was coming here to to speak on this. That was, that was messing with my head, right? It was messing with my head a little bit. Like, God, why aren't you healing me? Like, why is this happening? So he heals many who touch the fringe of his garment. He heals a Canaanite woman's demon-possessed daughter. Canaanite woman. Somebody who the religious leaders of their time hated this is interesting he feeds 4,000 people with seven loaves and a few small fish and then he feeds on a different account 5,000 plus people with five loaves and two fish I find this so interesting that he does more with less right sometimes it's like the less we have to contribute the more the more God has to be glorified. He walks on water in Matthew 14, 20 through, two through 23. He heals a man who is deaf and dumb. He heals a boy with epilepsy. Heals a boy with epilepsy. Let's go to Matthew 17, Matthew 17. Verse 14. It says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. And he's sore vexed, for oftentimes he falls into the fire and oftentimes into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And then Jesus answered and he said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and they said, Why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. So a couple of things I want you to see here in this, in this story. Okay? It says in the, in the old King James here, it says this man was a lunatic, right? He was sore vexed. 
But in the modern translations, it says he was an epileptic. An epileptic, okay? He had epilepsy. This boy had bouts of seizures. How many in here knows anybody with epilepsy or has known somebody with it, clinically diagnosed with epilepsy? Yeah, me too. Do you know what they called it in this instance? It was a spirit. It was an unclean spirit. And I think all too often, I'm not saying every medical condition is an unclean spirit. It's not. You'll, you'll read through these scriptures, and, and, and there's some of these guys that, what well, was due to sin, you know, or he was just born this way so that God could be glorified. Sometimes the blind people are healed, and and it was, it was from a demon. It was from a demonic spirit. Other times, they were just born that way. It wasn't their sin, nor their parents' sin, right? And so let's, let's not put God in a box again. And let's not say every sickness is, is from a demonic spirit. But let's also not say none of them are, right? I think all too often, we get clinically diagnosed with something in this country, and our faith is not in Jesus, our faith is not in the word of God. Our faith is in a drug that will cover symptoms, right? Sometimes it's spiritual. Sometimes. The other thing I want you to see here is that Christ said, this kind doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. So what does that mean? Does that mean if you encounter something in your life that you can't deal with, you pray over somebody and they're not healed, then you need to go pray and fast for them? Does that mean you do a prayer and fasting chain? I mean, you know, maybe. But here's what I think it means. If you are living a, a dedicated life to Christ and you have the habit, you have, you have the habits of being, of, you're a man or a woman of prayer and you are a man or a woman who fasts, then the power of God is going to be evident in your life. And when you encounter these situations, whatever they may be, okay, God is, is going to work through you to heal and to help and to deliver other people. You, you'll be able to walk in the Spirit. You'll be able to walk in the power of God. If your lifestyle and, and your daily habits are that of prayer and fasting, doesn't mean you need to fast every day, but it does mean when the Spirit tells you you need to fast, go on fast. Go ahead and fast. It doesn't just have to be once a year on the Day of Atonement, right? You can, you can fast as the Spirit leads. There, some of the greatest breakthroughs in my life have been after God prompted me that I needed to fast for an extended period of time, right? And I'm not going to give like medical advice and tell you how long you can or can't fast, but I will tell you this. I know people who can only do it for a day. I know people who've done it for four days, seven days, 21 days. I've personally done it somewhere in that range. And if the Spirit leads you to do it, he'll give you the power. God will give you the ability to do it, to do what he's calling you to do. So we've got a few more to get through here. He heals a blind, mute demoniac. This is an example of a blind man who couldn't speak because he had a demon. Not always the case. Sometimes, that's the case. He heals a woman who had been bound for 18 years by a disabling spirit. For 18 years, this, this woman was bent over and she couldn't straighten herself. And it says it was a spirit. Again, not always the case. I'm pretty sure I didn't have a demon that put my back out two weeks ago. <laughs> um, nonetheless, I had a condition, right? And so let's not be quick to, to judge everybody and, and try to put a, put a name on why they might be going through what they're going through. Remember Job and how his friends came to him and they swore up and down, oh, Job, you must have done something horrible. None of this would be happening to you. Wasn't the case. He cleanses 10 lepers on the way to Jerusalem. 10 lepers are on their way to Jerusalem. And he 
he, he tells these lepers, go and show yourself to the priest. It says, and as they went, they were healed. And one of them returned rejoicing. And he said, Didn't, weren't 10 of you healed? And only one of you came back to give God glory? That's the other thing. When God does something in your life, make sure you, you go back and give him glory. Make sure you share the report. Don't just bury it. That's a light. That's something that's to be shared with people so that God can be glorified. So he, he curses a fig tree on the road to Bethany. He's walking by, and he goes to find fruit on this tree, and there's no fruit on it. It, it wasn't even fruiting season, by the way. There really probably shouldn't have been any fruit on this tree, but he didn't find any fruit on the tree when he went looking for it. And so he curses this tree, and it says a few days later, the disciples are walking by, and they see the tree all withered and dead, and they were amazed that this tree had died at the command of the Lord. And there's a couple lessons in this, but here's the first one. We are to be ready in season and out of season so that any time God looks into our life, okay, he sees that we're bearing fruit. We're not supposed to be like everybody else who's, hey, we're, we're fruitful sometimes. Sometimes we're doing good. Sometimes we're on track, right? We're, we're to be in season and out of season. That's what he expects from us. Here's the other thing to take away from this. The power of life and death is in the tongue. The power of life and death is in the tongue. I have, uh, when I was younger, I, went, I know we're all from different backgrounds here, some more than others, but I, I was involved in a Pentecostal church, believe it or not. Columbus, Ohio, I mean, these were like fire preaching TV evangelist type guys, okay? I remember, uh, I was there for six months, by the way. It was way too much for me. I had, to, I had to get out of there. But I did see some incredible things while I was there. And I remember they had opened up a, an adult gentleman's club a few blocks away from the church, right? Strip club. And as a church, we got together and we proclaimed... For those doors to be closed and we said in the name of Jesus those doors are to close and you're never to reopen and you be driven out of this town it was about three weeks later the county came in and they shut them down and they drove them out right we have the power of life and death in our tongues and and it says that the, the, the righteous man's tongue is a tree of life, and those who are wise will eat of its fruit. And so we've got we've to consider the things that we say to each other, to our children, to our spouses, because this is a very, very powerful thing. And the person who can tame the tongue, it says that they, their religion is, is perfect. If you can tame your tongue, it's one of the hardest things to do. So here's, here's another one, okay? This time, he really did create money out of thin air. Who's familiar with this one? Man, you got them all, Justin. <laughs> so in, in Matthew 17, they, they come to him and they say, hey, we owe taxes, right? So what does he do? He goes, and go, goes to the lake, they get a fish, and they pull a coin out of the fish's mouth. He says, here. Go pay the taxes. As a business owner, man, I could use that miracle sometimes, right? I don't know. God doesn't really work in our lives in those ways necessarily, but he created money out of thin air. I can give you stories about how I used to be buried in debt. I mean, we, were, we, bar we could barely survive, right? And I cried out to God, and he paved the way to pay off all of our debts in a miraculous way in a miraculous way. And so the point here is, when you need something, don't worry. Don't worry about it. Because if you're serving God with all your heart, and if you're, if you're doing uh, what his word has commanded us, if you're following Christ, you're not living in sin. Right? You're loving 
your wife, you're honoring your parents. When you need help, God's going to be there for you. So he heals a servant's ear while he was being arrested. He raises Lazarus from the dead. You know, the fascinating thing I thought about when I read about him raising Lazarus from the dead, you, you remember how Lazarus was killed? He was beheaded. I'm sorry. Thank you for the eyeballs. <laughs> I correct myself. You can scratch that. John the Baptist was killed. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, nobody's perfect, right? <laughs> okay, scratch that. He raised Lazarus from the dead. That's enough. I guess he didn't have to be beheaded for it to be a miracle. <laughs> okay, um, here's one of the greatest things ever. Which one are we on? He lived a sinless life, right? And I think that that is probably one miracle that none of us would ever be able to perform because we've all fallen short. You saw that in me and what I just said about Lazarus. He died for us while we were yet sinners, right? I find that pretty miraculous. That is, that is a work of God. To, to care for somebody enough that even while they're against you or opposed to you or your enemy, you're still willing to love them, right? So the greatest miracle of all is number 33. Again, this is not an exhaustive list at all, okay? He, he did many, many things. 33 AD, okay? He rose from the dead, right? And who of us in here could say that without Christ, any of us would ever rise from the dead? So, having said all of that, here's my challenge to all of you, to myself. It says that greater works than these we will do. Who believes it? Got a couple people who believe it. When are we going to start seeing it? When are we going to start seeing it? So, do you want to know what the secret is? to begin to see the works of God in our congregations and in our communities and in our families and in our lives. You wanna know what the secret is? All right. Let's go over to Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five in verse 12, beginning in verse 12. It says, and it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy who was uh, seeing Jesus fell on his face and he besought him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And he put forth his hand and he touched him saying, I will thou be clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but to go and show yourself to the priest and to offer for your cleansing according as Moses had commanded for a testimony to them. But so much more, there went out a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And there's the secret right here. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. I think that a big, a big reason why we don't see the works of God in a powerful way in our lives is because all too often, we're too busy. We're too busy. We don't get away from it. We don't get away from our, from our busyness, from our work, from our relationships, from the fun, from the toil, from the devices. 
How often do you withdraw to a quiet place and spend time in his presence? Right? But this is the secret of Jesus. In fact, here's times that Jesus withdrew to pray in Matthew 14, 23. And after he had dismissed all the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Here's another one. Mark 1, 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and he went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. Again in Mark 6, 45 through 46. Immediately he made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. If we're going to do greater works than these, then we've also got to follow in his footsteps, right? John 6, 14 and 15, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. You see this pattern that Christ followed where, where he was constantly going away. He, he would go find a place away and he would spend time in God's presence. And this is the son of God, right? How much more us, if, if we want to see the, the great works of God in our life, do we need to, to have times away in his presence? How much more do we need the power of God than, than Christ did? Matthew 14, 12 through 13, and his disciples came and they took the body and they buried it and they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus, this is John the Baptist. This is why I got mixed up. <laughs> and they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. So he, he was constantly taking that opportunity. And, and now, what's the point here? Is the point that you've got you've to go find a quiet place out in the woods, out in the middle of nowhere every single day and spend hours in prayer to see the works of God in your life? No. No, that's not it. That's, that's not what God's asking of us. But, but I think what we do need is we need to, we need to be aware of, of where we are spiritually, personally, all of us, right? We're, we're all in a different place, and everybody's prayer closet's going to look different. Years ago, um, I, I went to Pastor David, and uh, he has been such a tremendous mentor to me, by the way, um, over the course of the last 15 years. But I've always gone to him with these questions that I have, right? Because I look up to him, in a lot of ways, he just, he's, he's so far above where I am and, and where I, where I want to go, Right? So I said, David, what, what keeps you going, man? I said, you, you're a businessman, you're a family man, you're a, a pastor of a church. I said, and you have so much going on in your life. You have so much responsibility and so much on your plate. And yet, when you get up there to speak almost every single Sabbath, I said, you are on point. You don't miss a beat. You're filled with the Spirit. Um, you're passionate, right? You know what he told me? He said the secret was his prayer life. David's a man who prays, okay? And, and back at the time, this was years ago, 10 years ago, okay? He was, he was living in Elsinore, and he had a different house, and he said he, he would go out in the evening, like after, after dinner, and he would just go out on his balcony, and he would spend a little bit of time with, with God. But he was pretty religious about it. In the, in the sense that he didn't miss his appointments with the Father. He made sure that, that he spent some time in his presence. And when we do this, you know, the encouragement here is for everybody to find that place. Because look, we all need help, right? We all need help to deal with the stuff that life throws at us. 
And if you don't have that quiet place where you can just go get away and be in the Father's presence, I don't know how you're going to deal with it. Right? But he would, he would go out and he would spend some time with God. And, and he said that that is one of the most powerful things that has helped him in his life and his ministry. Right? We see that same thing here in, in the life of Christ. You think about Daniel. Okay? The prophet Daniel. This kid was taken prisoner into Babylon when he was a teenager. He went through some serious trials, yet he never compromised. And what was Daniel's habit? Three times a day, as was his habit, right? When the king's edict went out, that nobody would, should pray to any god except for the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Says as soon as Daniel heard it, he went to his window and he flung open the window and he knelt down and he prayed just like he always did three times a day it didn't stop him from his his time with God right and you look at the life of Daniel you look at that example that he left now did Daniel perform mighty miracles not really not not personally right he interpreted dreams he interpreted the handwriting of the hand that came down and wrote on the wall when he was thrown into the lion's den, God shut the mouth of the lions. Why do you think that was the case? Daniel was a friend of God. Daniel was a friend of God. And why was he a friend of God? Because he spent time daily speaking to the Father. And how do you get close to somebody? How close can I be to my wife if I never talk to her. Come home from work and go shut myself in the room and do my thing and she, she's on her phone and I'm on my iPad and, and there's no communication. And day after day after day, this is, the, this is the, the method, this is the process, this is the habit. I'm not gonna be very close to my wife, right? In fact, we're gonna grow further and further apart. How much more with our Heavenly Father? If day after day after day we, we go and, and we never spend time with him, we never open our mouth, we never talk to him, how much more will we grow far from him? So there was... Um, there was a time when the disciples came to Jesus, right? And these were guys who saw it all. They saw all the miracles, all the signs, all the wonders. They were out there casting out demons. They were doing incredible things. And they come to the Lord one day. Let's go to Luke 11. And they ask him something, okay? Okay. It came to pass, this is Luke 11, starting in verse 1. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, this is Jesus, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, right? As John also taught his disciples. And so then he goes on to expound and he teaches them to pray and it's what we all know, the Father's prayer, right? Right? When you pray, say, Our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So does that mean that this is how we should pray? Like just repeat those words? No. No right? He's giving us the example. This is what the position of your heart needs to be when you come before God. And, and the thing that I want to highlight here is, is the end. To forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Okay. In Matthew, it expounds a little bit more and it says, because if we do not forgive 
others, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us. If we don't forgive others, he won't forgive us. And that's a step further in in Matthew chapter 6. So the key here is, if we're going to come to to God daily, I, I, I encourage us all, like we need to, if you don't have a quiet place, you don't have a place where you can just go spend time in his presence. You need to, you need to find one. Because things happen in this world and things get ugly. And things get ugly in, in the family and in the marriage and in the friendships and in the workplace. And if we don't have the strength to deal with the things that confront us in life, we're going to crumble, right? But this is a way to fill yourself with the presence of God, with the Spirit of God, with the things that we were singing about. Spirit, come, fill this place. So about two years ago, some of you know this, some of you don't, um, my family and I decided to pack it up and to leave California, praise God, for many reasons, for other reasons, not so much. Like, we really miss our friends. We really miss our family in Rock Valley, right? But about two years ago, we, we decided to pack it up and to move to Tennessee. And uh, we had we born and raised, lived there for, for 40 years. And the father said, it's, it's time for you to move. And we broke away and we took a step of faith and we moved. But I will tell you this, when we moved, God began to show us things about ourselves and our family that we had never seen before, right? We started going through trials. I mean, I thought my marriage was doing pretty good. Um, We thought that our kids were doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden we move and we got away from the fellowship and we got away from the busyness of life and everything that we had built in California. And it was pretty much just us out there, you know, our family. And now we had to we had to deal with each other on a different level. And we didn't have the fellowship like this. We didn't have the fellowship that we used to have where we were always busy doing the work of God. We were always busy in the ministry and doing this and that and going over to our friend's house, right? Having dinners with people. But when it became just our family, things started coming out. And it's not that these things weren't there. It's just that we were, we were always so busy. We never saw it. Right, And so it was a trial. And going to this feast this last year, it, um, my wife and I, I mean, we had, we had gone through some serious trials with each other. It was, it was something uh, that God allowed us to go through to grow us, to make us stronger. The conclusion, um, the conclusion that we came to ultimately is that the greatest work that we all have to do is, is to love, right? And agape love, agape love is it's not a feeling. It's an action. Agape love is something that you do even if you don't want to, right? So turn with me over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 13. And I know you all are all familiar with this scripture. First Corinthians 13, verse one. Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I don't have love, I'm sounding brass, I'm a clinging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have faith so I can move mountains, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Nothing. And though I bestow all of my goods to the poor and though I give my body to be burned, if I do not have love, it profits me nothing. I believe that this right here This is the greatest work that we have to do. It is by far the hardest work that we have to do. And so my wife and I made made these these goals lists, and I've been wanting her to get on this goals kick for a long time because I'm like a goals guy, right? Um, 
But she began to, you know, look at her life. Our kids are grown up now. They're, my son's getting married in May this year. He's 21. My daughter's 18. She got a full-time job. And my wife started going through this uh, kind of like empty nest syndrome, even though our kids still live with us, right? And I didn't know how to deal with this because she was turning on me and saying, you know, well, you better, you know, we better be closer now. We need to talk more. And I'm like, wait, where's this coming from? I didn't realize what was going on in her. I didn't realize what, what women go, I've been working my whole life, right? Nothing's changed for me. I still go to work every day. I spend just as much time with the family as I always have. But things are changing for my wife. And I didn't realize that. And I was taking it personal, like, what am I doing wrong, right? But the reality is, we all go through phases of life. My wife's going through this phase where the work that God has given her to do, and, and for, for ladies and for young mothers in here and mothers-to-be, I'm going to tell you right now, your greatest work is to love your husbands, and it is, it is to raise your children to fear God and to be an example to them. That is your greatest work, and there's nothing greater. And my wife spent the last 20 years of her life, and that's exactly what she did. She poured herself into the children. I gave her a hard time, so it was a little bit harder for her to do her part with me. But we worked through it. But she poured herself into these children, and now she's, she's feeling like, what am I supposed to do? What work am I supposed to do now, right? So long story short, she begins to make these, these goals lists and says, you know, I want to, I have these goals, you know, let's do these things. I'm like, awesome. My wife's on board. For 20 years, I've been trying to like be partners on these, vi have a vision for the future and let's do goals. Finally, okay. And uh, we sit down and, and, you know, one of our goals was we want to have deeper, more meaningful relationships with each other, with our friends, right, with our children, and uh, looking over, uh, <laughs> when we set the goals, uh, one, one of hers was, I might be exposing a little too much here, she said, I want to be a better listener, right, she said, I want to be a better listener, I don't want to be so quick to, you know, get offended or, or jump on your case about something. And I said, okay, so basically your, your goal is to be um, a First Corinthians woman, right? Your goal is, is to love me the way, the way Paul writes it out in First Corinthians 13. And I realized that, that my goal was the same thing, right? My goal was, man, in order to give my wife what she needs from me, I need to be the same thing because I'll tell you what, I can hold a record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13 covers that. It says love doesn't do that. I can sometimes be, be, be uh, arrogant, right? And think that my way or the highway. 1 Corinthians 13 says love doesn't do that. Okay? So let's read through this. And as we do, I want you to think about I want you to think about your relationship with your wife, with your spouse, with your husband, with your children, children with your parents, okay? And I want, I think we need to evaluate our own hearts as to where we measure up. So in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, he says, love suffers long. Love is kind. It does not envy it doesn't, it's not puffed up. It does not vaunt itself. It does not behave unseemly. It does not seek its own. Love doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. Gosh, that was me sometimes. I could, you just say the wrong thing in the wrong way or you raise your eyebrow that way. Man, I could get... I could get upset, right? I could get provoked easily. Love doesn't do that. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, 
and endures all things. So I don't know what, what version y'all are reading. That was King James. I usually don't, uh, don't do the King James a lot anymore. But the reality here is, number one, we need to be spending more time in God's presence. We need to, we need to find that place where we can get away and, uh, and seek the Father's face. And when you find that place and you go and you, and you pray, and you ask God to help you with whatever it is that's going on in your life, you have not because you ask not. And if you think that this, this whole get away and spend some time in prayer regularly is a cliche, because in Christianity it can become cliche to say you need to pray more. But I'm telling you right now, it's, it's a matter of spiritual life and spiritual death. It's a lifeline. And when you get away to pray, we need to make sure that we examine ourselves first, right? Because anybody going to bring his gift to the altar and there he, he realizes that oh, somebody's got something against him. He says, first go reconcile. And then come bring your gift. So we need to make sure that when we're going to spend time in the Father's presence, we're not doing it in vain, right? So loving our wives, loving our children, this is, this is by far the greatest work that we as men have. And women, loving your husbands, loving your children, and children, loving your parents, okay? This is the prerequisite for prayer because God's arm isn't short that he can't save, right? His ear isn't deaf that he can't hear, but it's our sins that separate us from the Father. And I think, I think sometimes the greatest sin that goes uncovered and unrepented from is, is the bitterness and the things that we can harbor towards each other. And if we can't love our neighbor who's made in God's image, and we can see them. How can we love God who we can't see? So the greatest, of, uh, the greatest work of all that we all have to do is, is to love. And that's what I want to leave you with. And please think about finding that, that place. Find that quiet place where you can get away and be in God's presence.